try to teach you everything I know about grazing in 45 minutes in a classroom session. So, yeah, this is going to be fun. Plus, they're making me stand still so they can videotape me. So it's not my style, but um, we'll try to get you through it. Uh, as I was introduced, thank you, my name's Jill, and I'm a grazing specialist with the Department of Agriculture. And I'm new to the Envirothon. I'm not familiar with, up to this week, I have not been familiar with the Envirothon at all but was questioned when this topic came out. So sustainable range management, and here we are in New Jersey, right? So this is a challenge. So I'm going to try to help you um, make this topic relevant to New Jersey. And timing was actually perfect because New Jersey NRCS got a new state con who happened to be a range specialist from Montana. So you can't get much better than that. Her and I put our heads together, and hopefully we'll give you a little bit of comparison of New Jersey to Montana. Um, so you're going to see the comparison charts like you have in front of you now throughout the slideshow, trying to um, draw some conclusions and maybe compare and contrast some positives and negatives of range and pasture between Montana and New Jersey. So let's start with just some statistics, and I think these statistics, statistics might be a little startling. When you look at available pasture acreage, New Jersey, 67,000 acres of pasture. Look at Montana, 36 million for private range and 31 million for public range. Gosh, how can you even compare these, right? So look at your average land value. New Jersey, $11,000 per acre compared to 706 in Montana. Right there is a drastic difference that you cannot ignore. Um, average farm size, 20 acres average size in New Jersey compared to 2,000 in Montana. 10,000 total farms here versus 28 out there. Um, <laughs> there we go. And uh, we have pasture and they have range. And the next two slides we're going to talk about the differences. But the two main challenges that we have here in New Jersey compared to Montana, we have population. Right? We, have, we are the most densely populated state in the country when it comes to population. So you cannot ignore that either. And then when you are talking about the price difference per acre, if they want to increase, they being Montana ranchers, if they want to increase their production by putting on more cattle or more livestock, they can usually go out and purchase more acreage to increase their pasture size. Because we have so many people, Land is not readily available, and really it's not economically practical when you're talking about $11,000 per acre. So now let's compare the range, the range versus pasture. When we say range, we usually refer to ranches, and that's Montana. They are defined by being native species, meaning that they can't go out and reseed, like we would reseed our yard, add more forages in to increase our diversity. They're stuck with what they have if they want to call it range. So these are usually grasslands, savannas, shrublands, deserts, all kinds of ecosystems. When we talk about pasture, like we have here in New Jersey, we have um, the ability to introduce forages, so we have more control over what we can supply for our livestock. So when we talk about grazing systems, usually I'm up here in front of a group of farmers, actually I'm outside in front of a group of farmers, trying to um, teach them the benefits of rotating their livestock. They already have cows, they already have a herd, or whatever it may be, um, and we're trying to get them from just throwing them into one big old pasture to dividing it up and rotating it around. And we'll talk about why that's important in, in a couple minutes. But when we're talking about a grazing system, there's three components. You gotta have the animals who have the need, you gotta have the forages that's going to meet that need, and then you also need some management. It doesn't just happen like that with the magic wand. So we're gonna talk about that too. Let's start with the plants. So in New Jersey, we already said we have pastures. Um, they're introduced, we call them cool season grasses. That's what you probably have in your yard. Bluegrass, orchard grass, perennial rye, we'll go through all those in a second. But they like our climates. Our climates are a lot different from Montana's, right? We have cooler climates, hence cool season grasses. Montana, hot and dry, hence warm season grasses. Our grasses need fertilizer. They need lime. They're kind of high maintenance, if you will. 
Out west in Montana, not so much. Um, they don't, when you're talking about 20,000 acres for your average ranch, you don't have the time or the money to land apply lime, fertilizer, things like that. So uh, elaborating on the differences between cool seasons and warm seasons, this is a growth chart. It might be hard to see. I tried to put um, the slides big enough for you to reference in case we were outside. I wasn't quite sure what kind of environment we were going to do this in. Cool season grasses is the growth curve to the left. Warm season grasses is the growth curve to the right and temperatures along the bottom. So as you can see, our grasses like it pretty much between 50 and 75 degrees or somewhere in there, which makes sense. When do you usually stop mowing your yard? Right? It's usually July when it gets up into 80s, 90s, somewhere in there, and our cool season grasses go dormant, which means they're not going to grow. That's great if you don't like mowing your yard, but not so good if you have a herd of 50 cows that are hungry and they need something to eat. And if the grasses aren't growing out there, uh-oh, what do you do? You have to buy feed. That's money out of your pocket. That's, in, that's cutting into your profit. Warm season grasses, they're just starting to take off in this hot weather. I guess you could say they're like beach bums. They like being in the real hot, that's when they start to thrive. So um, the goal of a livestock producer is to increase or extend that growth period as long as they can so that they can feed their livestock with forage that's naturally grown as long as they can without having to buy feed. So another growth, cur growth curve, and the screen has the different colors. When we look at the green, that is our cool season grasses. The blue in the middle is our warm season grasses. And the red is turnips and rapes. That's kind of the funky stuff, as I would call it. Um, usually annual crops that we can plant in the summertime that's going to give us forage into the wintertime. So that's what's really going to extend our um, gr growing season. And again, you can see when the green starts dipping in the middle, that's when the blue takes off. And the third is yet a third growth curve. So three slides I think is pretty important to know the growth curves and the differences between all of the forages. And again, you can see the dips in the middle of the cool season grasses and about the fifth one down is warm season grasses that, has, that peaks right when all the others are going dormant. So I won't get into the biology of the plant. The second handout um, I gave to you kind of covers a lot of that. I think you probably already touched on biology of plants and growth habits, things like that. So I don't want to go there. But two things from this slide I think that's important. And I don't have the ability to point, I don't think. But <laughs> that ain't going to work either. Um, the collar region. So that's right where the leaf meets the stem. It's called, well, it's labeled as an oracle on the top right diagram, but it's actually the little hands that clasp around the stem. That's what you're going to look at when you're trying to identify and differentiate between the different forages. So just know that's the identification piece. The other part is, um, it's not labeled, <laughs> but it's the growing point. It's very important to a rancher or a pasture um, livestock person. You need to know where the growing point is of your forages because you need to protect that. If the animal continually bites off that growing point, the plant's going to stop growing. Or it's going to take more time to get past that point, to recoup and grow beyond that to uh, mature and grow into a taller forage. So now I just want to fly through some of the different cool season grasses you would find in New Jersey pastures. 99% um, of all the pastures I'm in have orchard grass in it. I think it's one of the staples to New Jersey pastures. Um, I don't expect you to know a lot of this, just that it's very popular. Next one will be perennial rye, and the importance of perennial rye is to know your soils. Wow, really? This is a soils class with a pasture class? You betcha, because if you don't know your soil fertility, plants aren't going to grow. You have to have the nutrients there and available in order for the plants to have what they need to give you the feed to feed your livestock. So perennial ryegrass will only thrive if it's an organic matter of 4.0 or higher. And the only way you're going to know that is to have that soil test. So take home on that one is soil testing is just as important in a pasture as it would be in a cornfield or any other agronomic row crop. Timothy. I don't look as Timothy as an important pasture grass at, unless you are feeding hay. Does anybody have a horse or into the equine field at all? Okay, within the equine industry, 
big supporters of purchasing hay from livestock producers as well as hay producers, they look for that Timothy head. It's very distinguishable. It's very unique. So the only time I would ever recommend Timothy in a pasture is if hay is going to be harvested off of that as well. Tall fescue, I put this one up here because of that endophyte word at the bottom of the, of the slide. An endophyte is a natural organism um, that, that occurs in tall fescue that has historically been in a pasture. If you introduced it within the last 5-10 years, most likely it does not have the endophyte. But if it has been there for decades, it's going to have the end of fight. So why is that important? It's important if you are in an equine producer and you're reproducing, so you're looking for that offspring. Or it's important if you are feeding out any kind of livestock. By feeding out, I mean like a steer that you're trying to get weight on, you're trying to get the pounds for slaughter for meat production. That endophyte will cause abortions, it will cause poor weight gains. Basically, it just makes the animal really, really sick to the point where production is going to um, be hit hard and knocked back. Tall fescue is the one, the only one that's going to have that endophyte. Talking about brome grass, um, likes high fertility, well drained, just a very common grass when you talk about a lot of our pastures. And clover. Clover is a legume. All the ones we've talked about so far have been grasses. A legume is a different type of plant that um, they're different in that they're able to chemically convert nitrogen that's in the soil and make it available for the grasses. Nitrogen that's in the soil is chemically unavailable until the nodes on these legume plants can move the nitrogen around and actually feed the grasses. We like some legume in all the paddocks, not necessarily to feed the animals, but to feed the grasses. And then these are the brassicas that I touched on, the different stuff that we do just to extend the grazing season. Um, very digestible, very palatable, meaning that they taste good, the animals like eating them. And uh, so what should you plant after you have all of these? My recommendation is a little bit of everything. And diversity is a very important word when you're talking about pasture or range management. Why do we want that diversity? We already talked about the benefits of the nitrogen. The legumes can improve forage quality and reduce the potential of nitrate poisoning. That's a big one if you're a cattle producer. You need to know how the plants are going to affect the animals. Nitrate poisoning, if you go out and put a whole lot of purchased nitrogen fertilizer on grasses, nitrogen makes the grasses grow. Grasses grow real quick, nice, yummy, green feed. If you're a cow, you love it, right? You go out, you munch, 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 real quick, real fast. Oh my gosh, it's like eating a whole bag of cotton candy, your belly hurts. When your belly hurts, bad things are really going to happen, or at least if you're a cow. So it can actually knock out a whole herd real quick. The, nitro or the, the nitrogen fixing ability of the legumes prevent that. That's the important thing. That's a real important thing if you're a cattle producer. So the difference in root systems. Legumes tend to have real extensive root systems. The tap root of an alfalfa plant, if that rings a bell, is going to get real deep. Where grasses aren't quite as deep. So you're going to have a lot of variability in the roots. Why is that important? Because those tap roots can get to the deep moisture, water, can also get to the lower nutrients, so they're going to keep on growing. The shallower root system might start to dry up and have a little heat stress when things get into a drought system, but by having the differentiation in the roots, you're getting more, again, of that long-term growth curve. Grasses uh, lengthen the stand of forages. They just live a lot longer than your legumes do. You might have to come in and reintroduce legumes um, more often. Blow potential kind of along the same lines of the nitrate poisoning. And grasses compete better with weeds than legumes. Grasses tend to grow more of a mat. Again, think of your lawn. Most of your lawn is going to be blue grass, um, some grown grass, things like that. Spreads out in a nice mat. We don't want clumps. Legumes tend to grow in clumps. What that does is it lets a nice gap around that plant. Seeds of weeds that are in that soil and can be in that soil for up to 50 years then have the opportunity to get sunlight and water and flourish. Once they get those two things, they're going to germinate and they're going to start to grow. So we want to outcompete those weeds. That's our primary goal for this mix. This one's hard to see. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. It lists the different common plants 
in New Jersey, in New Jersey pastures. And you need to know your goals, you need to know your current conditions, and that's how you decide what you're going to seed into your existing pastures. Recently, with these weather, weather patterns we've been having, floods, major droughts across the country, knowing your drought tolerance, knowing your flooding tolerance are big ones. You can't read the quote at the top. I did everything grayscale in case we were outside. But it reads, understanding when and how an animal grazes and the difference in grazing among animal species is important to match the animal's needs to the forage supply. So again, you have a need, you need to make the supply so that it balances out. When designing a livestock operation, it's important to have a good understanding of the grazing behavior of the animals. So we're now moving into the animal part. We just talked about the plants, now we need the animals. So if you have a pasture, what are you going to produce? Hopefully it's not cows just because you think they're cute or goats just because you think they're fun. You need to know a little bit about the species so that the species matches up with the forage that you have available. So we, talk, we know what grasses are, we know what legumes are. Anybody know what a forb is? Basically weeds. I'm sorry. Basically weeds. And a weed, it, you know, the big tradition is a plant out of place. Well, I'm not such a big one for that. I think as long as a weed is not toxic, meaning it's going to hurt your animals, or invasive, that it's going to hurt your grasses, um, I'm not so much worried about weeds. There's a lot of research that there is nutritional value to most of the weeds in our pastures. So I consider them more into the Forbes category. So when we look at the different common animal species in New Jersey, and you've got to put deer in there even though they're not domestic livestock or animals, they're definitely an issue in our state. Cattle, they like grasses over legumes. Sheep, they like legumes over forbs, and then they go for the grasses if those two are missing. Goats, forbs, grasses, legumes, horses, just grass. They're the picky ones in their group. And then deer are forbs and grass. So when you're talking about grazing height, if you're talking from lowest, which is close to the ground, up to highest, it's going to be horses, sheep, cattle, and goats. And you got to think of their anatomy, and I know a lot of you don't know these animals up close and personal, so we'll hit on the differences. If any of you have a friend who has a horse or anything, you know that their teeth are tops and bottoms, and they can bite you. If you don't give them that carrot right, they can actually bite you. Their noses are really, really soft, and they're real agile. They can move around. They can almost mess with a hair on your arm. They're so particular, if you want to say that. Sheep, they have that split lip. So they can actually wiggle their lips up and down, and that's what enables them to get real close. Plus, again, they have the biting, the biting teeth. Cattle only have teeth on the bottom. So nipping that grass close to the ground isn't an option. There's no way they could physically do it. Plus, their noses is like a big square piece of leather, like a football. Think of how hard a football is with that leather. So they don't have the agility to graze real close. So how do they graze? That big old tongue. They got a big old tongue that swoops it out and takes a big bite of grass. So they're not going to get real close to the ground at all. And then goats, they just like to go high. If you ever saw funny pictures on the internet of goats on top of cars, hanging out of trees, whatever, they just like, like the up top looking down. So they're always going to eat from the top down. So let's talk about the diet preferences. We did a little bit. Just look at some of the patterns, you know, for grasses, your high ones in that column are your horses and cattle. So if you're trying to maximize production out of those two, you better have a predominant grass pasture. If you're looking at broadleaf weeds and legumes, that's going to be more along the line of your wildlife at the bottom, your elk, your deer, um, goats, and then sheep. Browse material, that's goats all the way. So goats have actually been used as a reclaiming feature, if you will, other than a grazing livestock. This is a research project where they were trying to get rid of, they didn't want the blackberry briars and the tall fescue, so they put a herd of goats in there for two weeks at a very high stocking density, and that's what it looks like. So that's the What's a high stocking density. Um, per, per a lot acre. of animals and a real no, no, small. No, like per acre. What's a number? Like, like how many goods they put in there per acre? Uh, a rule of thumb is a thousand pounds live animal weight per <laughs> acre to start with. Now this was twenty-eight hundred pounds per acre. 
figuring okay. average goat weighs between 90 pounds to 100 pounds. So 28 or yeah, 30 goats. Right, 28 okay. to 30 per acre. So that's real, real dense. So then let's get into what the animals actually need. And this kind of is to answer that stocking density a little bit more. This is some of the math that we do in our heads before we're actually putting the animals out on pasture. We need to know what the animals need to keep them alive. And then we need to give them a little more to get the production out of them that we're looking for, whether it be meat, whether it be a baby, whether it be reproduction, lactation, whatever. So two point. 0% of their body weight in dry matter for just your pasture pet. Just a horse in the backyard to keep it alive. 2.5 if it's a pleasure horse um, or a bred heifer, meaning an animal that's pregnant, a cow that's pregnant. 3% if it's a heavily trained or worked horse or a race horse or if it's a mama cow or a mama sheep or a mama goat. And then 3.5 if it's an older animal. So what does that mean? Well, when we're talking about dry matter, we measure everything in dry matter. And that is once you take the moisture away from that feed, what's left over. So pasture can be probably as high as 75% dry or 75% moisture, leaving only 25 to 30% dry matter. A feed that you might get out of a bag from a tractor supply or someplace like that, that's between 90, 95, 98% dry matter. So you need to know what you're feeding is the moral of that story. And then if you have a thousand pound animal unit, we just talked about that, and so forget about if it's a dog, a sheep, a cat, or whatever, thousand pounds of animal that you're trying to graze, you would want 25 pounds if it was this pleasure horse, bred heifer category. 25 pounds of dry feed. So there's a lot of math, and there's people who specialize in doing nothing but balancing this out. Okay, so when we're talking about animals, it's not just the domestic livestock. You have to take wildlife into account as well. There's the good and there's the bad. In this one, we're going to talk about the friends. What are the ones that we manage for? What are the ones that we like? We have pollinators. That's your bee in the middle. Instead of purchasing seed and putting seed out there, if we can do it naturally by having these bees cross-pollinate, take pollination from one clover plant to the other, that's going to save us money, and it's done naturally. Butterflies, same thing, can happen the same way. That's cowbirds on the back of that cow up there. We actually manage for birds. Birds are a good thing. Actually, a very important part when you're talking about the parasite cycle, that's probably the most um, difficult metabolic thing to manage is parasites and fly control. So by interrupting that life cycle of the fly larva in the manure, and birds thrive on that larva. They'll actually go out and pick through those manure patties. Um, that's going to decrease the amount of flies. Think when you're at a picnic and you've got three flies hovering around your head, how annoying and distracting that is. Imagine if you were a cow with 3,000 flies on your back. You know, they don't have a fly swatter. They don't have a lot of the conveniences that we have. So they rely on biology to help control that fly pressure. Um, Betsy's going to, I'm sure, going to talk about some of the grassland birds and how that can interface with grazing. It can be done by controlling your stocking density and allowing enough grass to be natural habitat for some of these birds. And then earthworms are a big one when it comes to increasing your soil fertility. They can help decompose the manure, break it up so that the nutrients are more readily available and quicker um, to get into the soils than if they weren't there. So now let's talk about foe. Um, when the topic for, the, for this year's Envirothon first came out, everyone went to the idea of bison and buffalo and elk and antelope. But once I actually started talking with our new state con about how Montana actually views those animals, it's more of a nuisance. So it's not so much a loving relationship. Um, when you are managing thousands and hundreds of thousands of miles of fence like they do out in Montana, which those huge farms, if you have a herd of buffalo, charging through your pastures, that high tensile or barbed wire fence is just an afterthought. So ranchers can spend a full-time job just repairing fencing um, torn apart by livestock. So that's the biggest issue when it comes to your antelope, your elk, and your buffalo. When you're talking about wolves, um, they're a 
prey animals or predator prey animals. So if you're in a reproduction type situation where you have young calves calving out in the wide open, that's just food for some of these uh, predator animals. In New Jersey, we have deer. That's a hard picture to see, but we have deer. You know, we're real good about managing our cows and keep them off of the growing pastures, but no one's keeping the deer off of our pastures to protect those grasses. So they're eating forage right out of the hands of these livestock producers and hurting the profit. Canadian geese are another big one. As our pastures start greening up, especially if you have any kind of a water body, they come in, and they don't come in as one and two. They come in at 30, 50, 60, who knows? You know, these huge flocks come in. They're ripping out the young plants and they're also depositing a whole lot of nitrogen. So a lot of issues that we have um, in New Jersey and Montana for wildlife. Okay, so this is kind of where I get on my soapbox when it comes to rotational grazing. But the benefit of a continuous grazing system meaning one big pasture, you put all of your animals out there as one, versus cutting it up into little pieces of the pie and moving that herd quicker through um, a paddock system. Grazing days, so that's the number of days that they're in that paddock. And if we look at the bottom at a continuous system, you're only getting about 30% of the available forage out there. The rest is being trampled. The cows are knocking it into the soil. It's being defecated on, so the cows aren't going to eat it once it's get dirty. But if you start moving them quicker, you know, just the 14-day rotation, you're already up 10%. You're into the 40% util utilization rate. If you get into the really intensive systems, one to two-day rotations, you're getting into 75 to 80%. Now, that's a whole lot more feed. When we're talking about making every blade of grass count towards meeting the nutritional needs of our livestock, that's almost threefold from your continuous system. So that's why it's important. This is a pasture. If you're grazing 30% and the animals were in the picture on the left, so if you're grazing 30%, 60% gets trampled in and 10% is just untouched. They didn't get there yet. Look what it looks like in about two weeks' time is your picture on the right. So although it doesn't look all pretty on the left, there's a whole lot of benefit once it regrows, and that's the beauty of the rotational grazing. Talking about the continuous versus breaking it up into the rotation, it's just a schematic of what I was trying to uh, relay. If you have 100 cows on 100 acres, one big piece, your stocking rate's one cow per acre, versus when you go to the right-hand side, you're going to break it up into 10 different paddocks. You're managing those 100 cows, in each cell. So they're going to be on the top left for 10 days and then they're going to go to the top right for another 10 days and then they're just going to go around that way. So the benefit of that is the remaining nine paddocks have a rest period. Those grasses can say, oh, finally I can regrow. They're, they're going to pull the energies from their roots and they're going to shoot more forage back up again and at a much quicker rate than if it was a continuously grazed system. When they're continually grazed, the cows, I always revert to cows because I'm a cow person, so I apologize, but the cows are going to go for the nice, lush, young grass. That's the sweetest. So they're going to nip a, a plant down. The next day, that plant's going to try to grow back. They're going to come across it again. Oh, looky here. You know, nice and yummy. They're going to go again. So they're going to keep going for the same plants. They're not going to go for the more mature plants, which are going to get um, less desirable, less palatable. So why are we pushing for rotational grazing? We're going to have more production per acre because we're managing for healthier plants. It gives us more dollars in the bank. Less need for purchased feed. We don't have to buy that hay and that high-priced bag of feed from Tractor Supply. More money in the bank. Can support higher stocking densities, more cows. We're going to have more production on our pastures so we can put more animals out there. More animals out there means more product, whatever that might be. So that's more money in our pocket. Increase in infiltration because we have less erosion. We're managing for those grasses. We're managing a nice, dense, thick sward is what we're after. So less of that fertile topsoil is going downstream into our streams and rivers. So that's more money in our pockets. We don't have to buy the nitrogen. We don't have to buy the fertilizers. We'll talk about the nitrogen cycle in a second. So that's big time more money in our pocket. And better way of life. It's just an easier lifestyle than have to go out and harvest all the feeds and bring the feeds to the animals.
when I talk with um, guys about writing up a business plan, these are just some of the things that uh, we talk about. And it helps, um, well, it's just one way to show that it's not an easy decision. It's not a matter of just opening a gate and putting them out there. Um, you have to put your stock in the right place at the right time at the right reasons. That's a whole lot of decisions in one little bullet point right there. Plan for the worst, drought, flood. You have to have a plan B. It's just like any other emergency plan. Um, you need to know what you want as far as landscape. What do you want your pastures to look like? You have to be flexible. Uh, you never have, you never follow the same rotation year after year after year. Uh, grazing planning guarantees you have feed. You have to chart your daily progress. If you don't keep track of what's going on, you'll never be able to see the trends, and that goes for anything. Planning allows you to open your mind to brainstorming. You have to be open-minded. You have to be open to new ideas. Most likely your neighbors aren't doing it this way and your father didn't do it this way. Planning must be consistent with your goals. Like anything, you need to have goals. And planning for the rest and recovery, you're managing for the root system. So how are we different in New Jersey compared to what Montana's doing? Montana has special pastures that they're using for summer pastures. So they do have some pasture that they can introduce forages in. And then they have ranges that they can use for um, winter use. So when you're talking about a 20,000 acre range, these aren't necessarily on the other side of the driveway or right down the road. They could be in different states, and a lot of times they are. So then you're going to need herders, or as we all envision, the cowboys, the Billy Crystal in uh, that movie, you know, moving the cows on, they're on horseback moving cows from one spot to the next. And uh, a lot of times they can relocate these on public lands, so they're not always their own personal property. They use natural topography as shelter. You're not going to see little barns and run-in sheds for the animals in every paddock like we have out here. They're going to use the natural dips, the low spots in pastures, and they're going to force them to stay there if they know a big snowstorm's coming or something like that. Um, they actually water with surface water. They create ponds to water and uh, artificial windbreaks to control some of the wind. Um, we out here in New Jersey, we prefer groundwater. We have more acid rain. We have more pollutants in our area. We don't want the livestock to drink the natural surface water. We want it to go through the ground to get that extra, extra level of uh, filtration. So we pipe our water, which that's big time expense. But when you're having 20,000 acre paddocks, you know, that's a whole lot of pipe to bury. So that's why they don't go that route. Um, we actually put run-in sheds in every paddock. And that's not necessarily for the animal's health as much as we have to keep our neighbors convinced that we're doing the right thing for our livestock. Um, so you have to be proactive in the neighbor relations because there is so much population in the state. We stockpile our forages. That means that if you have the available forage and the available acreage, you stop grazing at a certain point in the summer. You don't touch that forage. You let it grow as high as it can and hope that you can graze that throughout the winter time. And rotational grazing we already talked about. Pasture allocation equation. No one's going to expect you to know this equation other than there's a lot of steps that go into the math when you're out there trying to move your temporary fence to uh, size the paddock. The days that you have available, a lot of farms in New Jersey, the farmers work off farm. So they might only have nights, they might only have weekends. So that's gonna influence your rotation length. Number of animals you have, their average weight, the intake of body fat, that's that 2, 2.5, 3 that we talked about earlier, divided by the pounds of forage per acre per inch. We, uh, the next slide will show that a little more, but there's different ways to estimate the available forage out there, and that, uh, that's based on the soar density, or how thick the grass is. The number of inches available, and then the percent utilization came from the chart that we talked about earlier. So here's comparing the different dry matter per inch per acre. The top left picture is, um, it's a dry lot. There's not a blade of vegetation out there besides for the dry hay that they're brought in. Most likely that's a continuous graze system. So there's no forage available in that one. The top right, it's there. It's just not real thick, real lush. There's not a lot available. So we would call that about 150 pounds per inch. 
And then the bottom two, you can see in the bottom left, there's a whole lot of clover going on in that one. So that can prove the benefit that that clover has in increasing the productivity of the pasture. And then the bottom right, you can see, well, there's about 9 to 12 inches of available forage there. So that would be 300 pounds of dry matter per available inch. So that's a whole lot of forage. Another chart just comparing the, uh, the growth stages, and we talked about protecting that growing point of the grasses, and that's why we want to control how low they graze and how much they graze. That growing point is going to be different on each forage you have in your pasture. You, that's the importance of needing to know what you have out there. You want to put the animals into the pasture when they're between that four to six inch height range. You don't want to grow, graze less than two to four inches. And that, again, is to pr protect that growing point. Just to give you a visual of what I'm talking about when we talk about temporary fencing and grazing one piece and moving them to the other, um, obviously the cows are on the right side. They've been in there probably only about two to three days. You can see there's a lot trampled. So that would be your indication to get them out, the, out of there, that they're probably already done eating what they're going to eat, unless you force them to do otherwise. But you would move that fence and you would put them into the piece on the left that has been untouched. And that's what it normally looks like. That's about the stage that we want the grass and we're putting them in there. So how do we know how to divide up a farm? You want some kind of a central headquarters, if you will, or a dry lot or a sacrifice lot. That's to hold the animals off the pasture when the grass and the soils can't support the pressure. So either it's going to be snow covered and frozen, there's not going to be anything out there, or it's going to be too wet that the hoof pressure is actually going to be mucking them up. And uh, then you would have your paddock spoke off of that with your waterers and other infrastructure. You need to take into account your water system. Here we talked about New Jersey will pipe it. We can put it underground to a, a water. You need to keep fencing in mind, your gates, access lanes, and also your seasonal extremes. You have to have that summer emergency plan for drought and also future expansion. So when you look at an aerial photo, this is one of the farms that I've worked with. This is how they were doing it with pretty much two main paddocks. And I wish I could point to them, but you can see them. They're within the red to the left and then center. And then when we put in temporary fences, we try to make them into paddocks. And some of the things that you're looking for is you want those paddocks as even in size as possible, and you don't want points. You don't want um, sharp corners where the cows aren't going to naturally go into. Remember, they're prey animals. So they have that fight or flight, and most likely there's animals coming after them. They don't want to be in a corner. They want to be able to see around them in the wide open, and they especially don't want to have to leave the herd or the, all their buddies to go into these narrow points. Managing forages and livestock during drought. Um, again, uh, drought is a huge issue within the last three years and even a bigger issue out in Montana. Um, it's affecting hay prices here and all over the country. So diversity is the key to manage as much different forages to extend that growth curve and that grazing period as possible. And sometimes it might be to put warm season grasses into your farm. You would never put warm season grasses into your cool season grass pasture because competition wise they won't survive. But if you have enough acreage to designate one paddock for that warm season grass summer pasture, there's a lot of validity and value to that. You have to have supplemental feed available, or at least in the back of your mind, to supplement any kind of nutritional needs. You might need to reevaluate your stocking rates. You might have to thin your herd or take some of the dead weight or the animals that aren't producing like you hope them to produce. And mostly, do not overgraze. A lot of time, guys will just think that, uh, you know, well, if I can squeeze three more days out of that paddock, you know, that'll get me till the next one's ready, but you have to think of the negative value that's doing to the root system of your plants. This is a, a photo of the same piece of land where the big picture was um, the animals were just moved off, and it looks kind of rough. If you were out there in person, you think, oh my gosh, maybe I did graze it a little too close and it's going to be um, not so productive, but then that's, uh, I think that was 21 or 28 days later, 
it did lush up. It does come back. So uh, that's what we're looking for. And when we're talking about root growth, we talked a lot about this a couple slides earlier. If you look to the diagram on the right, one rule of thumb is you can always predict that your average growth above ground is going to be equal to your root growth below ground. So if you continually graze that plant off lower and lower or keep it low and don't let it sprout back to its full potential, you're killing your root system underneath. And that root system is what's going to feed that plant and get the moisture. If you can see um, on that root diagram, but all the way to the left, there's a little tiny piece, which is actually like a lawn. So think of your lawn, and when you don't get rain for, what, maybe a week, two weeks, it starts to go brown? That's why, because it doesn't have that root depth. We don't want that in a pasture system. So if you look at the chart, as you remove the volume of leaf, you're killing your roots. Very bottom. If you take 90% of that plant away, you just stop your roots, 100% of growth. If you're only taking 50% away, you're only stopping those roots 2 to 4%. 10%, you have no influence on your roots. So that's what grazing is, is managing for the roots of the plants. When grass is growing fast, use a short rotation cycle and harvest the surplus growth as hay or silage. When grass grows slow, use a long cycle and feed supplemental forage as needed. Kind of opposite of what common sense wants us to do. If we see the grass is growing real quick, we want to let them in there and maximize as much as we can, but that's not true because the rest of the paddocks are going to get ahead of you and nutritional value is going to go down. So it's actually a little different mindset. You can't talk about grazing and livestock in New Jersey without talking about the New Jersey Department of Ag manure management rules that just came into effect. Basically, producers need to account for every bit of manure that their livestock is producing. That's a problem if you are these huge equine facilities where you might have 60 head of horses on maybe 10 acres and only maybe 6 acres of available pasture. You're producing way more nutrients than you have the land to apply or to use up, use up those nutrients. Whereas if you're a grazing operation, your animals are putting that manure directly on your paddocks. So it's feeding that nitrogen cycle. And have, uh, are you all familiar with the nitrogen cycle from other classes? Okay, some yeses, that's good. So the nitrogen's coming out of the cow in the form of manure. It's breaking down with those earthworms or the help of some birds, going into the soils. Um, it's getting chemically changed around with the legumes, and then it's getting pulled up from the trees. So it's just a continuous cycle of being used, and it's kind of nice because if if done right, there's no excess, so it's all being used in one continuous loop. Controlling animal density and length of grace period controls uniformity of forage use, level of use, quality of the intake, traffic patterns, and manure distribution. That's what rotation's all about, is getting the manure out to every inch of that paddock so that all of the plants are getting equal doses of the fertilizers. This was actually a graduate um, students research project and what they did was they marked where the cows defecated and urinated and they put different flags. There's actually kids out there who study this and are interested by this. Livestock traditionally hang by the waters, by the gates, by their buddies, right, where life is good and dandy. In this case that's going to be the top right corner. Our goal in rotational grazing is to make every last square inch of that paddock desirable and enticing and trying to get them to go out to the far pieces. So when we divided it in half, you can see that temporary fence down the middle. Then we encourage them to fully cover that paddock and spread the nutrients all around. Free nitrogen. A lot of uh, farmers in New Jersey will multi-species graze. Mostly because of the grazing habits. We talked about how each uh, livestock species have different preferences, but also because their manures are different nutrient composition. Chicken manure is a big source of nitrogen, and nitrogen's the most volatile nutrient that we can manage on our pastures. So talk about winter feeding, and I'm up at time, so we'll, we only got a couple more here. Um, don't be scared to have livestock out in snow. You know, in Montana, they got a whole lot more snow than we do, but there's different strategies to feed them. And if the forage is there, they can dig through the snow to get it. 
Or in New Jersey, we promote building structures to contain the livestock off of the pastures when things are too wet or too uh, snow covered and the grasses aren't taking up the nutrients that we're there to put on them. And you got to hit marketing when you're talking about grazing in New Jersey because you have to maximize that population you have available around you. A lot of our producers are promoting things as local, grass-fed, through farmer's markets. Very few are sending them out to feedlot situations or into general slaughter, which would go into, you know, like your McDonald's hamburger or some of the larger bulk packaging plants. Um, Montana, they don't have that option because they don't have the population. They're not surrounded by housing developments and they don't have uh, 200 cars going in front of their property like we do here. And the, uh, the topic of the Envirothon issue talks about non-ag use. You have to touch on the fishing and the uh, large game hunting in Montana. Uh, the, the organizations that are promoting the recreational aspect of the range in the Montana have different intents than what farmers probably do. So there is a conflict about their management, how they'd like to see things managed, versus what's in the best interest of the farmer. So I flew through a whole lot of information in a whole short amount of time, and feel free to ask any questions. I will be putting a bunch of references on the Avirathon website. Um, some of it will be wildlife-oriented as well. So, um, is, is there a more technical term for the growing point? It's pointed out in there, but is it like... Is it, no, it's referred to as the growing, growing point. point. Yeah, the growing point of the grass. When you're taking a thousand cows and cutting down their pasture area from like a thousand, a uh, hundred acres to ten, do we have unhappy herbivores or no? They're just as happy. No, as ten because as they you're are actually happy. giving them a lot of forage, so they don't have to move as far to fill their bellies. To fill their belly. Right, mm -hmm. and you know they're heavily managed, so it's not like they're out there. They only get in trouble. It's like kids. They only get in trouble when they're bored. So okay. if you put them in there and there's plenty to eat and they're happy, they're doing what they like to do, okay. you're not going to have any issues. But if you force them in a really small area and they run out of feed, then, you you know, then, yeah, then they're going to start picking on the neighbor and going through the fence. Okay. Um, are we talking about with the, um, the amount of dry feed mm -hmm. for this amount of like, pounds that you have in there? Is that a problem that you have? Like, like, say you have this... Like some horses that you just keep as your pets, is it a problem if you have more than like 2.0 percent? It can be. Um, it's uncommon to do that because the drier the feed, usually the higher the price tag. So it's more money out of your pocket. But if you're doing it because if you're thinking of that horse as a pet and you're thinking, oh, well, if they're telling me to feed two pounds, if I feed four pounds, it's going to make that animal happier. Actually, you could do more harm because the digestive system of these animals really weren't designed to be confined and fed a real dry feed. They're designed to eat smaller quantities of feed all throughout the day. You know, and uh, when you're putting them inside and you're slug feeding, you're feeding those couple pounds of real heavy feed only two times during the day, that's when you get colic. And if you know anybody who has a horse, that's probably the biggest metabolic issue with horses is they can colic. And that's because they're just not designed to eat high densities, high amounts of feed in a real short amount of time. So they're, they're designed to graze. That's the beauty of it. Good question. Yep. What is the idea of our traditional agricultural uses and non-agricultural uses? Traditional ag uses, producing livestock, um, normal farming practices. You know, it can be traditional farming, growing row crops, corn, soybeans, things like that. I think they were getting at the non-ag uses, like I said, with the fishing and the hunting. Um, in New Jersey, it might be agritainment. You know, a lot of these farms try to make it a family experience to come out and buy your apples or buy your orange peaches by, uh, you know, having the games, uh, petting zoos, hay rides, things like that. So, um, anything from what you would think of agriculture 60 years ago is how we interpreted it. I don't know how the Envirothon's going to interpret, but that's our stab at it. Great. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So just to go over it. So if you have a very fast-growing grass, you want to rotate them through the pasture paddocks quickly. Quickly. So that that grass can regrow. If you've got a slow-growing place, you want to keep them there longer. Why, again? 
Either keep them there longer, or you, that's the time where you might have to supplementally Take feed. Take them to the dry. You always want to put your livestock in the piece that's the best nutritional value. So it's not necessarily the same rotation you've done last year. Just because it worked last year, it might not work this year. If things are growing real quick, you want to put them into the paddock that has the right stage of nutritional growth. If you move, if you keep them in one piece and you wait till the other pastures are most likely going to be more mature, too mature that it's not a good amount of feed for them at that moment. By moving them quick, is that you're, because of nutritional value of the grasses, or because they won't eat the mature plant? Both. Okay. Both. Their intake's going to go down because it's just not good stuff anymore. You know, it's high lignin. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you just want to take, like, the tips off of the plants and move them to the next one. Yep. And you're going to be moving them quicker. You know, you might be moving each paddock every day or every other day versus seven days. But you're, you're keeping it at the right stage of nutrition and also maturity for palatability. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.